15 minutes we're going to have some discussions and some lighter questions but dean tell me what if there was no map how would you see the world today here's my answer <laughs> <laughs> cool if you're if you're not on the map you don't exist Thank you very much. That's, that's I said, it's going to be very light and very simple. So Don't I get to say more? <laughs> you can get the same one as well. Well, I mean, but I think that's, that's what we're all faced with, right? I mean, yeah. from the very earliest days of mankind, uh, they were sketching, they were documenting, they were creating maps and models of their world, things that were important. Mm. In fact, as I grew up as a child, or most of us, the map is the first thing which helps you to interact with your city, your nation, and the world. That tells you where mm. you are. Can I just yeah. add something, though. One of the, um, the conversations that we've had at, at Ordnance Survey is, historically, the map has been a, a dumbed-down version of all the information that's available, because the human mind can't take it all in. So, you know, historically we've had 500 million features in our data set and actually what we do is render those into a 1 to 25,000, 1 to 50,000, 1 to 1,000, 250 uh, map. The really interesting thing I think for us is we're going to be able to unleash all 500 million data points because it's not going to be human beings who are looking at a map in the future. It's going to be machines who are taking a nano data point, who are using it, creating value from it, and then moving on. So I think the concept of map is an interesting one and will continue to have relevance, but I think it's also about just geospatial data, you know, about information about X, Y, and Z coordinates. So let me borrow a question from the Cambridge conference which was held in Oxford. So the gentleman who posed a question at that time in Cambridge about six months back is still in the room, Professor Christian Hipke. So I'm just going to borrow that question he said that he told to ask the mapping agencies that, do you think that one minute update of the real time map is good enough for our digital world? Would I like to take this question again? For me? Yeah. Um, for some, some purposes, yes. Uh, for other purposes, no. And I think that's where the team sport comes in. Um, but though you're going to have sensing um, or probes, so which could be a car, it could be a satellite, it could be a person, um, who are going to be pulsing information. And for some use cases, that pulse has to be received, processed, and used there and then. So if I'm driving down the street, I want to know that the pulse is actually being used rather than stored, and then in a week's time, I get to know whether or not I can drive down that street safely. Um, and that's putting huge um, challenges out there when it comes to processing and managing. And that's something that we're investing in at the moment, is an engine that can manage far more and manage far quick, more quickly um, than it's ever had to in the past. I think the yes. other, just to, uh, to build on that, you'd be surprised how much of the world population doesn't have a map, um, doesn't have an accurate map, doesn't have a map that they can use to be able to move goods and services um, and to meet the needs of the population. So we, I think you, I had the opportunity to work with customers all around the world and there is still a huge opportunity to be able to bring accurate maps to different, uh, to populations around the world and get the productivity enhancements that come from having that ability um, and the accurate sets of maps. So different parts of the world are in very different places with the accuracy and the um, and the validity of, the, of their maps. And so there is, a, there is an opportunity to be able to unlock the productivity of lots of populations by bringing more accurate maps. Oh, great. Actually, that's what I had a follow-up question to you, that <coughs> you talked about digital world. And we have a digital world on the one side where you need an updated map almost in real time for autonomous vehicles and things like that. But at the same time, we still need 
more than half of the world to be mapped. So how do you think that digital world is going to democratize and commercialize the space uh, and the value of the space technology uh, from your perspective? Well, I think having a, um, I think having a vision of the world and a digital version of the world is, um, is a quite valuable thing that allows you to be able to see the change detection that's happened in uh, communities over time. It allows us to measure things like what's happened in the climate um, over time. And what I see going forward is the ability to bring that information to a wider and wider population. And so as we do that, um, as we do that as an industry, as we do that by working together, then a larger portion of the world's population will have access to that information. Now, I think that's a, that is, yes, um, an opportunity for, uh, for uh, Digital Globe, but it's an opportunity for the community working together. And to commingle the data sets that we have and bring together the data sets that we have to achieve that objective. If we do that, we will bring the power of um, industrial revolution to lots, to a much bigger population. So I see that evolving quite rapidly over the next 10 to 20 years um, and the next five years specifically. But I think that's an opportunity for the industry and look forward to participating in that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, in fact, uh, that's the fact that we are moving very fast towards being uh, you know, in a digital and physical world, connecting that. And uh, uh, taking forward the real value of the maps which helps you understand your social fabric, your economic fabric, your political fabric. So how do you think, Jane, uh, this democratization process of the data, which is getting into the hands of billions and billions of people almost daily, is uh, a challenge for you as well as an opportunity? Well, I think this, the notion of community GIS is the one that becomes most empowering uh, for actually helping geography, GIS, uh, actually go to work in, in any community for any purpose. It's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, you know, actually, I'm going to, I always have to challenge somebody here so Amy you're my target this okay. morning here but <laughs> you know in a way you what you say is true but there's some but I see it a little bit differently okay and it's not just geographically areas where we don't have maps actually the we're, we're missing the type of map we need and the information products that we need to actually improve what we're doing uh, that actually is everywhere. Um, I, I, I actually work with some of my colleagues to say, okay, where is the most digitally advanced? Where is the place on the planet where everything exists to take the existing information they have, be able to integrate it, be able to apply it to all kinds of different problems and actually use it in the way that people are talking about and envisioning today. I can't think of a single place, frankly. I know maybe you know of a place. I don't think those are different things. I think those are complementary ideas. So I think first you have to start with a foundation, an accurate, um, an accurate set of information that you can then build on top of. And those data layers are possible once you've got an accurate um, an accurate base map, an accurate map upon which to build. And so I see those as complementary ideas. And yes, I think that you get value unlocked by the different information layers you can put on top. So mm -hmm. buildings and the three dimensions of those buildings. Um, but I think you have to have an accurate, um, an accurate um, base yeah, map upon which to reference. start. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which actually we have reference systems and so on. But anyway, long story short, uh, you know, what is holding us back, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, it's accessibility to the information, just having it there where you can grab, mm -hmm. it's like anything else. When I'm thirsty, you know, I, thank goodness there's a bottle of water there. When yep. I get nervous before I come up here, I can sip some. 
but uh, so it's accessible. You've made that accessible. So how do we as a profession and an industry make this the right information accessible? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is our challenge. So technology as an enabler, I think, is not a challenge anymore in terms of providing you a facility for or other mechanisms for access. How do you think that Nigel can help you in this process? <laughs> I, I, I think you, the point you make around technology is a, a, a very fair one. That uh, you know, his, historically or previously, we'd have been talking about major capital investment required on a city by city or state by state basis, um, and that paradigm's moved. You know, now you can have access in the cloud. You know, you, there are open source alternatives, there are proprietary alternatives, they're available. And so I, I agree with you. Technology is not the issue. Um, yeah, I think the, the two things which occupy me in thinking about that future are capacity and capability. So the skills that are available in that domain, even if the technology is available, even if the data is available. And then it's back up to the higher level of political will and funding and orchestrating. And that, that's where I think, again, it's back to being a team sport. You know, there's stuff that suppliers can do, stuff that advisors can do, stuff that philanthropic bodies can do, uh, but I think also events like this where you're bringing together the political, the, the supply chain, um, the, the players in the marketplace, really, really valuable because you need to have all of those things working to really break through. So skills, capacity, capability, political will, political organization, funding, those are the things which concern me, not necessarily data and technology. So I'd, I'd add one more thing, sure. which is uh, a few extraordinary people who actually don't let any of that get in their way. Yeah. Uh, that, that actually is the thing that I've learned over my career, is uh, watching people, you say, oh, that, that can't be done. Well, we've got this hurdle and that hurdle. And, you know, maybe people aren't smart enough or they don't think about it, but they just, some people just are extraordinary and say, no, I, I, I'm going to get this done. And they actually find ways to do it yeah. and lead others along that path. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Amy, I have a question to you because especially in the light of your much larger merged or converged umbrella which you have, Maxer, you have a company which is providing uh, design, manufacturing, launch, operations, as well as uh, data analytics through Radiant. So what is this larger vision of Maxer towards making the power of Earth observation handy to the people? Thank you for the question. So uh, many of you know Digital Globe just um, merged and joined a larger company called Maxar Technologies. And that, um, and that acquisition was just completed in November. And now we are part of a larger company that has four divisions. So SSL builds satellites, small satellites, big satellites, communication satellites. Uh, MDA builds ground systems as well as operates radar satellites and does robotics. Digital Globe operates Earth observation satellites. Uh, and, uh, and I spoke about that earlier um, in some detail. And then Radiant does analysis on uh, geospatial information. And we think that those components are needed to participate in the new space revolution. And so we, what we're seeing is the ability for more and more companies to be able to launch satellites to, um, with rocket technology and satellite technology that is stronger and better. And then the ability to bring that data back through ground systems and to communicate to those satellites and have the, the best Earth or orbiting satellites in the world. So that combination, that ecosystem, we look forward to being able to bring to a larger customer set around the world. And we believe that, um, that if we do this well, we'll be able to bring uh, more and more communications capabilities to larger populations and to more customers and to more communities all around the world. Oh, thanks. So uh, last 30 seconds to each one of you to deliver your message. Nigel? Thank you, Sanjay. They, but the most terrifying words you ever hear from Sanjay is, I don't know what I'm going to ask you. Thanks. Um, 
I think be optimistic and be open in who you choose to collaborate with. Emmy? Um, my final words are the next, the next several years are going to be exciting. Um, I, am, I think it's going to be a fascinating to see how the, um, the fourth industrial revolution unfolds. And I think we will see real change in our lifetime that we will look back on and we will be proud of. And I think I wanted to echo Dean's point. If we can engage this community and unlock the power of creativity that's in this community, I think we'll be able to do amazing things. So thank you. Dean, you have the last word. Well, for me, uh, I've watched my career go, in a sense, the same way that uh, the evolution of the map has gone. From when I was a young forester in the field with no maps, I was climbing trees and drawing maps in the dirt to communicate with my colleagues where to go do something. Uh, to now, everything is available in my pocket to find whatever I need. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, that's been the course of about 40 years. Well, we don't have another 40 years. Uh, so what I'm looking forward to, actually, is really accelerating to three, five, ten years to really bring this vision that we've all talked about to life so we can actually begin to apply it and bring us back towards this notion of sustainability. Thank you very much. Please give us a big round of applause to my speakers.